of men. Friends and supporters of that radical Mr. Fox did attack local constables sent to keep the peace. I will show by evidence that this fellow Nicholson did knock the aged and innocent Joseph Casson to the ground, rained down violent blows upon his head, and in doing so, took his life. I call the witness Thomas Davy. I came upon a sight of great spectacle. Supporters of Mr. Fox and Sir Cecil Ray crying out for and against the butchers, as tradition demands, clacking together their marrow bones and cleavers, and the whole scene. Mr. Davy, might you leave off these dazzling depictions to those of the press paid to do it? The matter here is murder. I ask your pardon, my lord. Indeed, the mood then did darken. As Fox's ruffians, armed with bludgeons, sought to satisfy their violent appetites. And in the ensuing melee, you saw Joseph Casson struck and fall. I saw this man, as clear as you see him now, with arm raised high. And I saw the man I know now to be Joseph Casson fall onto the ground. I see here. The margin of the magistrate's record of your statement. There is a note added by a very fine attorney. Tell me if it is, as he puts it here, that you are the man who passes his days abusing with fine language those gentlemen associated with Mr. Fox. And once throw dirt at the person, Mr. Fox himself. Do you question my honor, sir? Were you not also paid, sir? Paid? to rally against all those who stood for Mr. Fox. In fact, is not your performance here a continuation of that employment? How dare you that? Who but a fox man such as you, sir, would defend this other fox man? Mr. Davy, we are not voting here today. We are about a man's life. Do you claim you saw the blow struck, sir, that murdered Mr. Casson? I saw the tableau of that tragic death most vivid. Answer the question, Mr. Davy. Did you see this fox man strike Joseph Casson? I will confess it. I did not. struck the blow. Your prejudice is clear. This prosecution is it. fantastical. Now, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Garrett. Where is Lady Sarah? The answer plainly, I do not know. I wish most sincerely that I did. You would have me believe that you played no part in her abduction of my son. I know nothing of this, sir. Nothing. But if it be true, I know nothing of where she or they might be. Believe me. And you will believe this. Your sour inamorata has once again sabotaged my career and my prospects. Such scandal in the hands of Lord Melville is a poison to my endeavour. You're not Faust to his devil, sir. No, sir. And even if Sarah is run off to France with the boy, I will pursue her. And I will bring an end to this.
I call Joshua Gilmore. Do not see this man on the indictment. With your permission, my lord, uh, the man I would call is a new discovery. I will allow it, Mr. Sylvester. Continue. Mr. Gilmore, you were at the Covent Garden on May the 10th and saw the fracas involving this man, Nicholson? I did, sir, and saw Joseph Casson struck by that man in the blood-red coat, Hubert Nicholson, with a large stick with a nub to the end of it. Are you sure that that man was the man struck the deceased? I'm sure of it. Upon my word, upon my honour, and upon my oath. Sir, you appear nowhere in the coroner or magistrate's account of this matter. Why did you not go before the coroner to report any of this? My reason was this, sir. I, uh, came up to the Bailey yesterday about a little business I have of my own and saw from the notices displayed that this matter was to be tried. You came here by chance yesterday? Yes, sir. I see. Do you not agree, although I myself believe every breath of your testimony, that for the gentlemen of the jury, there might be some small room for speculation? That the first you heard of this business was today, in some small coffee house off Silver Street, where certain officers of the law gave you this speech to learn by heart. They would scapegoat this man and corrupt this court. I have objection, my lord. Once again, he all but lectures the jurymen. Mr. Sylvester, whilst I abhor Mr. Garrow's habit of gossiping with my jury, I feel I can only agree with his concerns. I've heard enough. Gentlemen, even supposing you can possibly credit the witnesses examined for the prosecution, you will find nowhere, I regret, a reliable account so to connect Nicholson to the death of Castle. But it is for you to determine whether you will not acquit the prisoner. My lord, we find not guilty. Miss Casson. Mr. Garrow, forgive my calling at your home, but I'm occupied by a question and have need of your help. I regret that I am unable to give it, being concerned at present with other things. I confess I was bewildered by what I saw pass for justice in court yesterday. Madam justice was hardly present, and little of what you saw was concerned with the death of your dear father. I saw the trial was, in great part, politics, and I am most naive in matters political, but... Madam, forgive me, but for the sake of your own peace, you might let go of the cold mechanisms of your father's passing and, and have instead the fonder memories of his living to replace them. If you ask that of me, then you do not understand grief at all, sir. Well, I promise I do. 